The day was March 11, 2020. That afternoon at lunch, I, I had a meeting with the, the local ministerial association. And as the meeting was going on, one of the, uh, the pastors that was there took out his phone and, and looked and said that, that our governor had just issued a request for all churches to suspend in-person services because of the COVID-19 pandemic. At that moment, I had heard a little bit about the coronavirus, but didn't know a, a whole lot. And my, my first inclination upon hearing that is, surely this thing isn't so bad that churches need to shut down. In fact, we, we continue to, to plan on having in-person services here at, at Central. But then the days kind of went on, and it seemed that, that this virus was getting worse and worse by the hour. But the decision didn't come till Saturday afternoon. I was on my way to go uh, for a run. I was training for a marathon, and and I had heard that there was a, a church where um, a lot of people ended up getting COVID-19 uh, from this church gathering. And I reached out to a few of my deacons, and I said, you know what, it may be wise for us to, to not have a church this Sunday. So it was March the 15th that we ceased having in-person services and we did not meet again until June. Almost three months went by with only having church online. Since then, we've been, been meeting in person on Sunday, on Sunday mornings only. Things are definitely not the way they used to be. They're not ideal. They are inconvenient. We gather in person with, with masks. We're in a different building. We have to social distance, but at least we're able to gather to, to worship. But when is life going to get back to normal? I never would have pictured back in March that we would still be dealing with this pandemic some six months later. And the hard part is, is it looks like we may be in it for at least another six months. And, and who knows what's going to happen from there. You know, it wouldn't be far-fetched to consider that, that we are kind of in a, a season of gloom right now. I know not everything is bad. We're still able to do some of the things that, that we love and enjoy doing. But, but so much of our life has just been rooted upside down. In fact, my, my daughter, Riley, just had a uh, turned six years old this past Friday. And we've been thinking about what type of party that she wanted for, for almost, the entire, almost the entire year. And so much did she want to be able to, to have a party where her friends were able to come over. But because of this pandemic, we had to say, sorry, honey, we just can't do that this year. And yes, we, we made it fun and it was, it was a great occasion, but it wasn't like we wanted. You know, in the biblical times, some 400 years had passed between the last Old Testament prophet Malachi and the first and last prophet of the New Testament, John the Baptist. Note the Israelites, they were in a 400 year season of gloom, hoping that each day will be better than, than the one that was previous. Each day that they were hoping that, that God would, would, would send another messenger. And I don't, hopefully don't think this coronavirus pandemic is going to last 400 years. But, but in some ways there's some similarities because we are just taking it one day at a time. Hoping that tomorrow is going to be better than today and that it was yesterday. But the good news is, is that God was, was faithful. He was faithful to send one last prophet who was the son of a priest. And his name was John the Baptist. Now John was, was an eccentric, although very popular prophet. He spent most of his life out in the wilderness, never cutting his hair and, and eating locusts and, and honey. He had been preaching for about one year by the time we get into our passage in, in the Gospel of John. And, 
And in that time, he had, he had cultivated quite a, a following, and he had been baptizing many people. It's because of this popularity that, that John ended up uh, attracting the attention of, of the Sanhedrin. Now, the Sanhedrin were the ruling body of, of the Jewish people. They were largely made up of, of the different groups, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and the scribes. And they're all similar, but yet they all had different uh, roles, different views, different beliefs on, on things. And most of, uh, of them opposed Jesus. But there were some, some holdouts. We, we know from Scripture 2 and specifically who was Nicodemus, which we're going to see later on in John chapter 3, as well as another Pharisee named Joseph of Arimathea. Now, Joseph uh, was the man who lent his tomb for Jesus to be, to be buried in. And it was in our passage here in John chapter 1 where where the, 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 the Sanhedrin come and, and they, 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 they send a few of their representatives uh, to, to come to interrogate John. And they had just one simple question. And it is, who are you? But they really didn't want to know who was John. No, they were asking all of these different questions to find out, is John the Messiah. Now, have you ever been asked a, a leading question before? In fact, in, 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 in law, the leading questions are prohibited, all right? Leading questions is a way to kind of manipulate the person who is being asked a question to get an answer that, that, that the, the person asking wants. And John the Baptist here is being asked a leading question after leading question, and he answers them so beautifully. So the first question that these that the Pharisees ask John is, who are you? And then in verse 20 of chapter 1, John says, well, I am not the Christ. All right, so John already knows the answer that, that these Pharisees are looking for. And so he just right off the bat says, look, I am not who you want me to be. Because they were trying to manipulate him, to, to, to indict him to, in order to, to, to get him into to some type of, of trouble. So he says, I'm not the Christ. But then they, they, they probe again and they say, well, then are you Elijah? Now, Elijah is an Old Testament prophet. There are some similarities between Elijah and John the Baptist. Now, one of the key uh, things about Elijah is Elijah never died. No, he was taken up into heaven in the chariot. But, but Elijah also had long hair and lived a, a rugged lifestyle like, like John the Baptist. But he says, no, I'm, I'm not. I'm not Elijah. Then they ask him a third time. They, they, they say, then are you the prophet? Now, they didn't ask him, are you just any prophet? Because obviously John is a, a prophet. But they say, are you the prophet? prophet. Now, this prophet that they are referring to is what Moses had foretold in, the, in Deuteronomy. He said that there would be a prophet that would come and say everything that I have, have told you. And John says, look, I'm not, I'm not this prophet that Moses has foretold. And then one last time, they ask him, all right, we know who you're not. But who are you? Look at what John says here in verse 23. He says that I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. See, as we saw last week, Jesus is the word, but John is the voice. Right, John is not coming to be anyone. Rather, he is coming to point others to the Word, to Jesus. And then they ask him this question here in verse 25. That they say, meaning the Pharisees, it says, Why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? Look what John says. It says, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know. Even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. 
See, these Pharisees, they, they didn't really care about John. They just wanted him to say that he was Jesus. But he continuously deflects the attention from him and he places it on Jesus. John says, look, I am unworthy. I'm not only am I not Jesus, but I am unworthy to untie his sandals. You know, we as followers of Christ, we, we should be known for our humility. I've heard it said that, you know, humility is not thinking less of yourself, but rather it's thinking of yourself less. See, most of us, and me included, a lot of times we think that the world revolves around us, right? We are the most important person in, in the room. And, and when things don't go our way, then we, we think that something's not right here. <laughs> you know, nothing has brought this to light probably more than our COVID-19 pandemic. I mean, how many, we want, the, we want all of the safety regulations out there to keep everybody safe and to keep this virus at bay and to get rid of it until one of those regulations inconveniences me and prevents me from being able to do what, what I want to do. You see, we, our default is, is not to be humble. No, our default is to, to think too much of ourselves. We must actively, we must actively pursue humility. I mean, if anyone had the right to boast in themselves, then it would be John the Baptist. I mean, in fact, Jesus himself said that, that there is no one that was born on this earth that is greater than John. So John the Baptist was humble, then we too should be humble. Let's look at the message that John brought. In verses 29 through 30, we read that then the next day he, he was with Jesus coming toward him. And, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Man, this, this statement, this bold statement has a special meaning in a way that we in the 20th century, or sorry, 21st century in America, we just, we, we just can't understand it, it uh, as, as a first century Jew would. See, I mean, a lamb, right? I mean, sheep are not really that important to us. Uh, I mean, I can count on one am. By the times that I've, I've eaten lamb, you know, I mean, I do wear cotton shirts, but, but I rarely think of, of sheep. You see, the Jews, they lived under the Old Testament sacrificial system. And this scene here in John chapter 1 takes place just days before Passover. Now, the Old Testament Jews would, would take their, the, 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 in, the, in, in the book of Exodus, the, in, in they would take the blood of the lamb when they were slaves in Egypt and they would place it on their doorpost. And they would do so because God said that if you take the blood and put it on your doorpost, then when the plague of death comes, I will pass over your house. And so every year on the Day of Atonement during Passover, they would bring their best lamb to the synagogue to be, to be slaughtered. Now, this high priest was the one who would do the, the sacrificing. And by the time that, that, the, that the, the high priest was, was done sacrificing, he would be swimming in sheep's blood. Think about that. Because salvation is bloody. But this lamb would also have special significance to, to John the Baptist. See, lambs weren't just sacrificed on Yom Kippur or Passover. No, every morning and afternoon, a lamb was sacrificed at the altar by the priest. Well, John's father was a priest, and so I'm sure that he had seen his dad just slit the throats of, of numerous lambs. See, in the Old Testament sacrificial system, 
It was, it was a sinner all right, that would bring the lamb to be sacrificed in order to pay the penalty for their sins. But the deal is, is that it was just a temporary solution because every year they would have to come back with their lamb and, and year after year would have to have it slaughtered in order to pay for their sins. And so when John declares, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John's saying, look, guys, it is a new day. The Holy Spirit, or the Holy God, has sent the last and perfect sacrificial lamb to take away the sins of all of those who believe in him. So John tells these Pharisees what he had witnessed. He says here in verses 32 through 34, he says that I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. See, God told John to look for a sign that the Messiah was coming and he was here. Now, obviously, John knew Jesus because he was, he and John were, he and Jesus were, were first cousins. But John did not know that Jesus was the Son of God until he had baptized him and then the Spirit of God descended on Christ like a dove. You see, John, he had a personal encounter with the Son of God, and he gave up everything to point others to Jesus. You know, we love our heroes, sports heroes, political heroes, entertainment heroes. You know, almost every day I read or watch the news, and and I see one of these heroes that has done something sinful. And we see all of the pundits come on or that are trying to, to defend this, this modern day hero. That's, I mean, it's not just one person in particular. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of uh, powerful heroes that, that we follow. And we end up justifying their sinful ways. And, and we compare them to, to somebody else who is more sinful than they are to make them look even better. But friends, none of our little heroes are going to bring us any satisfaction. In fact, most of the time they end up bringing a heartache. But sadly, you know, these, the heroic qualities that, 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 that are found in, in John the Baptist, those are the qualities that are ridiculed in today's society. See, John was humble. And he pointed others to Jesus, calling them to repent of their sins and, and to place their faith in Christ. I mean, just think about this. Think how much better would our communities be if we had a few more John the Baptists in the world? Friend, you and I are to be John the Baptist. Now, I'm not saying that we're to, to quit bathing and to grow out our, our hair and to go on the insect-only diet. I'm sure you'd lose a lot of weight on that one. But we are to think of ourselves less. And we are to point others to Jesus. So how are you going to put this? How are you going to put this into practice this week? See, Jesus is many things. I mean, he was a teacher. He was a, a miracle worker. He, he was a healer. He was a wise man. And there's a lot of talk today about Jesus fighting our battles for us and, and giving us the power to, to carry on and to, to, to work hard for us. And all of those things are true, but they, are, they all pale in comparison as to what he truly 
came to do. Because these are not the main attributes of him. No, Jesus. Jesus is the Lamb of God. See, if you've been to church... Uh, I mean, I'm sure you know this. Right? Jesus is the Lamb of God, right? We, we, we sing all kinds of songs about Jesus being the Lamb of God, especially when we get around to Easter time. And while it is absolutely true that Jesus is the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world, the question that I want you to answer right now is this. Is Jesus your lamb? Is he your lamb? Yes, he's the lamb who takes away the sins of the world, but is he your personal lamb? You see, in order to pay for sin, a blood sacrifice must be made. And year in and year out, that sacrifice was a four-legged animal. But that sacrifice never completely satisfied. You see, Jesus, Jesus is the spotless lamb and he came to be your substitute. He took your place for this penalty for your sins that you must come to account for. Is Jesus your lamb? Has Jesus taken away your, your sins? Yes, his sacrifice is sufficient, but you must believe that he is the Son of God. And since by faith I saw the stream, thy flowing wounds supply, redeeming love, oh, it has been my theme, and it shall be till, my, till I die. It's his Redeeming love, your theme. 